Hello, I'm Dr. Lawrence Brown, the Director of the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps Program. We are proud to present this special webinar series on the way that communities are responding to COVID-19. Throughout this series, we will lift up the social and economic dimensions of the current pandemic. In addition, we aim to highlight the historical context of place and space to help explain where and why COVID-19 hotspots are emerging. Finally, we will provide a forum for the stories of impacted communities and their innovative solutions that we hope you will share and lift up. We also know that before the pandemic arrived and now, not everyone has had the same opportunity to live a long and healthy life. Story after story in the news media shows the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 in Black, Latino, and tribal communities. This pandemic is shining a light on long-standing inequities that exist in this country because of racism, historical trauma, urban apartheid, and rural disinvestment at every level designed to create barriers to opportunity that we must overcome. We intend for this webinar series to be an opportunity for community leaders to come together, examine the inequities this pandemic has exacerbated, and explore data and evidence-informed strategies that can enable positive change both during the time of crisis and during the time of recovery and healing. We encourage you to share what's working in your community and learn from others who are also making tremendous strides. Let us work together to build a new nation on the foundation of health equity and social solidarity. Welcome to COVID-19 disproportionate, disproportionate Impact on Tribal Nations. This webinar is the third in our health equity and social solidarity in the time of pandemic strategies for COVID-19 response and recovery series. County Health Rankings and Roadmaps is based at the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute and is a collaboration with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We would also like to acknowledge that this webinar series is a result of contributions of many colleagues and partners in Wisconsin and across the nation. Thanks to their support, we're able to bring you this webinar today. Hi. My name is Carla Freeman, and I'm an action learning coach at County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. I live in Roswell, Georgia. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the original inhabitants of the land I am sitting on here in Georgia. The Cherokee, the Appalachie, the Muscogee Creek, and other indigenous tribes. Some of these tribes were forcefully relocated to Oklahoma in the 1800s and are still dealing with the trauma of that injustice. We want to honor their place here today. Today, I am joined by my colleague, Attica Scott, who is also an action learning coach with our organization. Hey, Attica. Hey, Carla. Hey, folks. Just want to let you know that I'm monitoring the uh, Q&A box. It's different from the chat box. So if you have questions for our guest, then please put them in the Q&A box and we'll lift them up uh, as many as we can during the Q&A session. Thanks so much, Carla. Thanks, Attica. And I also want to take a moment to introduce our other colleagues joining us to enhance your learning experience. Raquel Born and Ness will be chatting with you in the chat box. Hey, Raquel. Hi everyone, I look forward to engaging with you today over chat. Um, and when chatting, please um, change the default and instead select all panelists and all attendees so that everyone can see your chats. Thanks. Awesome, thank you. And last but not least, our technologist, James Lloyd, who will take care of any technology issues. Hey, James. Hi, Carla. Thanks for letting me be here. I really appreciate helping with this topic. And should anyone have any technical issues, feel free to instant message me in the chat by finding my name, James, and I'll do what I can to help. Awesome. And I also invite you to join us after the webinar to dig a little deeper into today's topic 
Immediately following this webinar, we will offer an interactive discussion group to exchange thoughts about how strategies related to today's topic may work in your communities. These conversations give you the chance to be face-to-face -face with other webinar attendees and share what you are doing locally, as well as ask questions of the participant. We are pleased to be able to offer these sessions in partnership with Healthy Places by Design. Joanne Lee with Healthy Places by Design will be our lead facilitator. Watch the chat for details about how to connect later in the webinar. We'll be sending that information as we approach the closing of the webinar. Now I want to introduce you to our honored guest, Dr. Patricia Nez Henderson. Trish, if you want to go on and show your video, open your video, that'd be great. Patricia Henderson is Vice President of the Black Hill Center for American Indian Health. She received both her MD and MPH degrees from Yale University. Dr. Nez Henderson is originally from Tisto, Arizona, a small community on the Navajo Reservation. As a Navajo scientist, Dr. Nez Henderson is one of the leading authorities in tobacco control and prevention in American Indian communities. Her work has led to the Navajo Nation passing commercial tobacco-free policies for government workplaces and ceremonial settings and increasing excise taxes on tobacco products. In addition, Dr. Nez Henderson collaborated with tribes and tribal communities in developing, implementing, and evaluating culturally relevant research projects. Recently, Dr. Nez Henderson has been working with the Navajo communities addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Nez Henderson is a panel member of the 2008 update of the Public Health Service Clinical Practice Guideline Treating Tobacco Use and Dependence, a Federal Drug Administration Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee, and the Health and Human Services Interagency Committee on Smoking and Health. Welcome, Dr. Henderson, and we look forward to hearing from you in just a moment. County Health Rankings and Roadmaps has two primary overarching goals. The first is to improve health outcomes for all. This includes both how long people live and how healthy they are. The second goal is to close the health gaps between those with most and least opportunities for good health. We believe that everyone should have a fair opportunity to be as healthy as possible, regardless of where we live or the circumstances we were born into. But not everyone has the same opportunity to make healthy choices. These unequal opportunities create differences in health and do not come about on their own or because of the actions of individuals alone. They're often the result of policies and practices at every level that have created deep rooted barriers to good health for some people. We see this in areas like bank lending practices, redlining and school funding based largely on local property taxes. That means that everyone does not have a fair and just opportunity to live a healthy, long and healthy life. Our goal is to change that by offering communities data evidence and guidance to take action. We work to support communities by bringing people together to look at that, the many factors that influence health, select strategies that can improve health for all and close gaps, and make changes that will have a lasting impact. We do this by providing data, evidence, and guidance for communities. Now in the data section, there are county snapshots, which shows your county health measures and reports. Under the evidence tab, what works for health strategies is a wonderful database of evidence informed policies and practices. And in the guidance section, the action center shows you key activities for taking action and the partner center helps you determine who best to partner with. And finally, under the stories section, this is where we lift up stories of communities that we feel represent the culture of health. Now, one of the ways we start with our work is through our model. Many of you may be familiar with our model. 
we know that the rankings are really a starting point for your work. We use the rankings to start or broaden conversations about health and equity, to draw attention to gaps by place and race, to prompt urgency on the issues influencing health, and to move those conversations to action. As we think about COVID-19, what we provide at County Health Rankings and Roadmap is data that can complement your local or state COVID data to help you start thinking about areas and populations that are at most risk to help inform your response and think about how public health departments and their partners can focus on assisting moving forward and how to equitably distribute resources to all people in order to continue to improve health for everyone. So I just want to lift up our model as something you might want to check out on our website as a resource. And be sure to stay in touch with us. We have a presence on Facebook and Twitter, and you can also learn more about upcoming webinars and our latest tools and resources by signing up for our e-newsletter. But now, let's get back to our guest, Dr. Henderson. Welcome, welcome. I'm so excited that you are here. I know we've all been looking forward to, to your visit. And I know I read your bio, which was very impressive, but I'd love for you to tell us just a little bit more about the Black Hills Center. Sure. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, um, especially those that are joining from Navajo Nation. Yat A. Shea, Patricia Nez Henderson, Dasha Jene, Zatlavin Shla, Totsotni Bashish Ching, Chenjikine, Dasha Nale, Ashe, Dasha Che, A. Sado, Mado, Ze, Shenen Shle, Ado, Chejent Fatoe, A. Yasmasha, Oko, Ado, Dyson, Slagi, Yan, Kiddishin, Toyat A. Greetings, everyone. Um, it is always, always, we're always encouraged as Navajo people to introduce ourselves in our own language. Um, I said my name, my clan, and uh, where I'm from, and uh, just want to say greetings to everybody that have joined today. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm here in Rapid City, South Dakota, um, right at the hills of the, of the Black Hills, or Heisapa, as it's called in Lakota. First, I'd like to acknowledge the this ancestral lands that originally belongs to the Lakota tribes, as well as other tribes that use this place for ceremonial purposes. It's unceded territory and um, just very, very grateful that I'm here among the Lakota people. So 20 years ago, actually, um, actually even probably about 22 years ago, when I first met my husband, I was in med school and uh, had at that point decided that I wasn't going to practice medicine and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do for the rest of my life and met my husband and um, he lived here in Rapid City. He's from the Cheyenne River Sioux tribe and he had practiced as a physician for the tribes and uh, felt like he could do a lot more doing preventive things in public health. So he founded the Black Hill Center for American Indian Health. It's a nonprofit organization located here in Rapid City. And the primary goals is really providing uh, research in a manner that really uses um, tribal, in, tribal um, I guess, uh, tribal input. Um, people call it, you know, uh, people call it other things, uh, but it's very, very precipitatory. Um, and we've really used this method to get things out to the Navajo Nation as well as other tribes in terms of just addressing the health needs. So we have two kids. Uh, they're now two, two uh, teenagers. One just is, um, she's a sophomore in college and the other one is in six, he's 16. And I'm sure they're not gonna be too happy when they see nationally their photo of them when they were just young. So, but it, yeah, I just, um, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Thank you for that. And it's like two teenagers saying that. Yeah, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> Well, we hope everyone, um, we, we asked everyone to um, take a look at the video, which is going to be the basic, uh, basis of our conversation today. Um, and we sent the link out because we thought that might be a better use of our time to talk about the video. But we'd just love to see if you want to use the raise hand feature to show us if those of you that actually were able to see the video and view it.
Awesome, awesome. Well, the link will also be in our, our resource um, guide as well that you will get after the session, but we're excited about that. In the meantime, I'm gonna ask um, Dr. Henderson if she wouldn't mind just sharing a few highlights from the video of those that weren't able to view it. Absolutely, this was actually a really nice um, overview of COVID on Navajo Nation. Um, it provided an insight to really some of the issues that are at hand that have contributed to the high rates of COVID um, and its aftermath and uh, highlighted actually my community. Um, if you go to, I think it's like 16 minutes at that time frame, it kind of has this aerial view of, of this beautiful area. Um, that's where my family is from and uh, and the physician that is meant that is interviewed in this, Dr. Michelle Tom is from our community as well, mentored her and just, yeah. It's always really wonderful to see this, um, to talk, you know, to see our president talk about some of the issues that are at hand and what is happening. And it's just really, really unfortunate, like just seeing everything from afar. And you know, I usually go back to Navajo at least, gosh, probably every other month, you know, just the work I do and to just be here in Rapid City and see all that happen to, to my community. It's just both frustrating and, uh, but you know, we, we're, we're doing whatever we can. Well, that, the video was um, just so touching. And um, I think some of the stats, as we were talking about before we got on today, that video was produced, I think in May and even since May, the, the numbers have, have continued to rise. So um, it's still just as, as relevant. And so we just appreciate um, you taking the time today to talk about it. Let's switch gears a little bit because you talked a little bit about the fact that you're from Navajo. What does home mean to you? Uh, home. Well, I was born, actually, I was born in Kings Canyon, Arizona, which is now uh, a part of the Hopi Reservation. I have to say that the Indian Health Service there in Kings Canyon was the first hospital in the world to go smoke free. So I have to, you know, give props to everybody that made that happen years and years ago. But I grew up um, what is now the Hopi Reservation. Um, if in that corner, you see this be beautiful butte. Um, it's called Zithibe'i in the Navajo language, Nipple Butte. And um, that's where I was born. That's where I was raised for many, many years with my family, my dad, my late father, and my mother, and my three siblings. We all were raised there. Um, no running water, no electricity, just, uh, you know, just beautiful way to, to, to grow up. Um, we didn't have television, so we were exposed to just the outdoors and, of course, running and everything was just, it was just incorporated into everything we did, just outdoor life. Um, unfortunately, in 1974, I believe, federal um, policy was passed, not federal policy, a court case was ruled, it ruled in favor of the Hopi Nation to, for Navajo Nation, for, I think like 10,000 Navajos to be relocated from those lands. And, and for me and many other folks, uh, many other relatives, this was very, very difficult. Um, because as Navajo people, we believe that home is where our umbilical cord is buried. And it literally took me years, years of trying to figure out how to come to, I guess, how, how to heal, how to, how, how to have my spirit heal because that land was taken, you know, and I can never go back. Um, I can visit, you know, I actually have an aunt that still lives there and she's one of the resistors, you know, she, she plans to not ever be relocated. I think she's like 96 right now. So, but that's where home is. And I try to take my children back to the reservation. Um, because it's really, really important for me as an, a Diné woman for them to be exposed to the language, the culture, and for them to appreciate just, you know, everything about the Navajo Nation. So, but yeah, that's home. <laughs> and it's beautiful. That sunset is just absolutely amazing. So thank you for sharing some of these beautiful photos that really 
um, depicted for, for the audience. Tell us a little bit more about Navajo Nation. I know that you talked a bit about the um, fact that that's where you're originally from, but maybe you could just kind of talk a little bit about it um, geographically, et cetera. Sure. So the Navajo Nation, um, a lot of people like to compare it to the size of the state of West Virginia. It's a huge, huge land base located in, um, in, in the southern part of the United States. We occupy, the nation occupies, um, or it's actually lo located in three states, the state of Arizona, um, New Mexico, and Utah. So, well, the film said that there was like over what, 100 and probably 40,000, 50,000, depending on what numbers you look at, that reside on the Navajo Nation. The tribal population at this point is over 320,000 meaning that there's a large population of us that actually are rural natives. We, we live off the reservation. Um, in many cases, um, a lot of them live very close to the reservation because, of course, you know, housing is an issue. So a lot of them um, travel back and forth for work. And uh, so it's, it's a really beautiful area. Um, the other unique thing about it is that the Hopi Reservation, which you'll see on the screen, is right, well, actually in the lower southwestern part of the Navajo Nation. So it's a totally different tribe. Um, one of our employees, um, she actually just uh, left the organization, is from that community and um, very different. They speak a different language. Um, their culture is very different. Um, and up till the land dispute, we actually were very close. Uh, we used to, they used to come onto our lands and take sheep manure, for example. And they used it, they used the sheep manure for their potteries and, um, and they made the most amazing peaky bread, which is this beautiful delicacy. Um, and then, so we did a lot of exchange, um, but the land, land dispute, which was actually over coal, um, you know, um, just really kind of put a friction between the two tribes. And I think it's getting a lot better now, but that's the unique thing about Navajo Nation though. It's and that we have this special relationship with, with this tribe that, that is just, we totally surround them. So, <laughs> but yeah, it's just been, it's been really wonderful to, to grow up in this area. As we talk about COVID though, I just want to highlight, as we're looking at this map, I want people to understand, like when, when President Naz, as he was talking about the, the lockdowns, this, what is it, like the 56 hour quarantine, it, this is very challenging. As I said, many of our Navajo people live off the reservation, or they actually probably live on the reservation and go off the reservation to work. And so it makes it very, very difficult to enforce these quarantines when you are totally surrounded by these border towns. And, um, and we can talk about a little bit more about these border towns in a few minutes, but it's just, yeah, it's just a, a very unique and beautiful area. Thank you so much. And you sort of touched on this, but Let's talk a, just, a, just a little bit about those historic policies that, um, that have been passed. And um, I'll go ahead and the, the next slide then, James. Thank you. Well, when we talk, when people talk about colonization, you know, I, I kind of think of it in a way where, you know, that, that um, partners, two partners, right? There's one that is kind of imposing their views on a community. And then the other one responds and then assimilation occurs along the way. I wouldn't call that for the Navajo Nation, actually. It was more a sub subjugation, subjugation um, oppression from the very start from the time we signed, we signed the, signed the treaty, even before the treaty was signed in 1864, you know, thousands, 10,000 Navajo families were relocated, were forcibly marched actually to an area in uh, New Mexico. And, you know, and they lived in a condition that you can't even think of. It was just horrible. 
um, but through a lot of prayers, actually, um, in 1868, a treaty was signed, and it was actually more of a peace peacemaking treaty between the Navajo Nation and the federal government. That, and uh, but then the Navajo Nation, during this time period, you have to remember, you mentioned the tribes in Georgia, that there was there was um, forced relocation for these tribes. The federal government during that time actually created what would be what is now Oklahoma, right? They thought, oh, let's just bring all the native people to Oklahoma, Indian territory. We'll just kind of bring them back there. But Napo people actually had to negotiate for them to go return to their homelands back onto what is now Navajo Nation. So, um, and then that started the relationship with the Navajo Nation as well as the federal government. And that has continued. And, um, and just, if you look at Indian history, um, tribal history, especially for Navajo Nation, there's just series of errors, errors that have taken place over that time period that have put the nation at a point where they're fighting for their sovereignty. Um, we'll just take one example in the 19, in, in 1920s, um, the, the federal government actually had a policy to come onto Navajo Nation and kill thousands and thousands of sheep, basically, it's a life reduction, right? So what we call, you know, um, our revenues or our funds to sustain us was all of a sudden with the snap of a finger just taken away from us. And that has continued in the 1950s, you know, during that termination era, relocation era, excuse me, that continued um, hundreds, if not thousands of Navajos were actually forcibly relocated to urban cities like Los Angeles, Chicago, um, New York, just everywhere, except for the nearby cities near the reservation. And so it's just been a constant, you know, um, I guess, force, force history, force policies that have been put on the Navajo Nation. And it, it's kind of, kind of got us to this point. Um, another important thing that I want to mention is also, um, Taxation, you know, that how the states and cities, that's how they make money, right? At least some monies to provide, um, you know, provide, provide uh, programs for their communities. Well, the Navajo Nation was not even allowed to do that. Um, there is an oil company that came on board onto the Navajo Nation, and the nation said to this company, like, hey, we're going to start putting taxes on you. And this company said, well, I don't think you're going to do that. Well, the Navajo Nation took them all the way to the Supreme Court, and um, the lawsuit was, um, the, the, thankfully, the Supreme Court ruled in our favor, and so I think like, since 1985, the Navajo Nation has been able to put taxes on products. So it's just, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure if they're testing our sovereignty or what they're trying to do, but it's just been one policy after the other, even we're fighting for water rights, right? huge the Navajo Nation we, we the it's just right smack right in the middle of where the Colorado River flows you know and there's aquifers we had to fight for that again so it's just um it's just been one policy after the other that the federal government has put in place to basically control control the nation and I think the beautiful thing about it is that we just have some amazing people on the Navajo Nation, both in, in the reservation as well as off, that really fight for our sovereign rights. And, and we're going to continue to do that, you know, and uh, whether it's with water, uranium, anything, you know, now we're fighting COVID, right? And I think just with all these policies, time after time after time has just created this environment where you know, it, it's just very difficult for us to get a hold of what is happening there. But these policies, we need to remember they, you know, they, they've created trauma. And Dr. Paula Braveman, um, one of the Lakota scientists from this area, actually writes 
about this, about historical trauma and the impact that it has. And I think people just need to understand it's like, this is, you know, the, this is the federal government we're talking about. And we just celebrated what just several days ago, 4th of July. Well, if you look at the, the United States Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, actually, if you take a look at it, these are the words that are in there. The merciless Indian savages. This is our Declaration of Independence. Like, I mean, this is exactly how the federal government has viewed us. And in my opinion, you know, it, it has not changed too much. You know, um, we're still fighting for our rights. We're still fighting for a lot of things. And I think one thing that I found that as, as I was preparing for this talk is that you know, when America um, passed the Citizenship Act back in the 1800s, actually in the 1700s, everybody was included. Everybody was a, was a constitutional citizen, right? Well, then that was totally withdrawn for American Indian tribes. And it was until 18, 1927 that we became citizen, but our citizenship actually is different from yours our citizenship is statutory, meaning with a stroke of a pen, the President of the United States can relinquish our citizenship. It's not constitutional. And I think this is really, really important for us as, as we go forward. The Constitution can be amended. Um, it's just that easy, but as, as tribal members, as you know, advocates, we, we can do something about that. We can advocate that we become constitutional citizens just like you. Um, but I think with COVID, it's just, um, you know, it's just been really awesome to see what is happening with Black Lives Matter and um, our, our Native communities throughout are, are really beginning to, to, to make sure that, that the trauma that has occurred for hundreds of years doesn't continue for for my grandchildren, my great great grandchildren, seventh generation down, I'm hoping that when they look back on this period that they'll they'll see like, oh goodness, there is a big change. This was a changing point. And um, it's just been really remarkable to see that. And, and unfortunately, COVID also, we see the ugly side. You see this quote that was um, that is up there on the screen. It's a, I didn't do any uh, spelling correction because I wanted to make sure this is what that person wrote on, on Facebook, right? And basically, yeah, I mean, this gentleman, non-native non person said these things about Navajo people, like, yeah, it, it's just kill these Navajos, you know, that are, that are infected with COVID. So these are the border towns that I talked about, you know, pages right on the border. We have Winslow, Gallup, uh, Flagstaff, these are, are towns that just um, are right next to the Navajo Nation, Farmington. And I think what needs to happen now is that, you know, we, we really need to work with the counties. The Navajo Nation needs to work with the counties. Actually, it's the other way around. The counties in the state have to work with the Navajo Nation. You know, we have a governor now in the state of Arizona, like, Hello, you know, Navajo Nation has been dealing with high rates of COVID for months now. And I, I just don't understand how he cannot see this. This is within the state of Arizona. And that we have Navajo people coming on and off the reservation for work to live. And then we have family members that are coming in from Phoenix to the Navajo Nation just to take care of their loved ones. But he just, it's just, I, I'm just really baffled by, by the governor yeah. of Arizona and, um, yeah. yeah. I think um, this is also, um, what do they say, it just pulls your heartstrings um, because I think it just speaks to um, the lack of humanity, I think, um, as it relates to, to some of these issues. And um, I just appreciate you really um, showing that sometimes we think of things as that was back then, but to look at this Facebook post and see that that's current um, is just really to remind us all 
that the the struggle continues. Um, you know, this is just a fight every day. I want to just switch the conversation a little bit, Patricia. And I just appreciate your um, willingness to be just authentic in this conversation because I think that's um, what we need to hear and what folks need to hear. Um, let's talk about that CARES Act funding um, and those the dollars. Um, I don't know if you need to take a breath first and then you can <laughs> oh, that's go a whole in. Issue, huh? If James would mind just moving to the next slide, that would be awesome. Yeah, go, go and right ahead. Sort of look, look at the decision making as it relates to um, the CARES Act funding, because in the video, he also, um, that's also um, addressed as well. Sure, absolutely. Um, so the CARES Act is supposed to provide services for the communities um, all the way down into the tiniest communities that have been impacted by COVID and that has been the case for Navajo Nation. Um, and uh, so what has happened is the Navajo Nation actually um, provided data back to the federal government, both the uh, Secretary of Treasurer and the, uh, the Secretary of Interior to define how much monies they qualified for. And it was based on the population, the employment, as well as expenditure data that, that the nation had to put together. And um, funds, when, funds were then earmarked for, for the tribe, for the Navajo Nation tribe, as well as for other tribes in March of uh, March of 20, 27th of March. I see an arrow on my PowerPoint there. <laughs> and that was March, right? So the nation is now in the midst of COVID and no money. So literally the Navajo Nation had to dig into their own pockets, which is very shallow, trying to figure out how to address this pandemic. Um, and that's when I'm sure all of you, a lot of you have seen just all the wonderful donations that have been made by nonprofits, um, individuals, all the way from Ireland folks donating. Um, so I just really, I guess in my eyes, being here in Rapid City, I, I just want to thank everybody who contributed to, to our communities down on Navajo Nation because up to that point, up till May 2nd, there was no money. There, we just kind of had to make ends meet. And we're talking about, you know, community where the health service is totally underfunded. Indian Health Service has been chronically underfunded for many, many, many years. And um, so if you go on to the nation, you will see that if you go on to the Navajo Reservation and other tribal nations, um, you will see this, that the healthcare is not the top and it should be, but it's not. So in Mar May of 20, May 2nd, the nation finally received $600 million. Woohoo, right? Very exciting. If you think I look at this number, six, $600 million is a lot of money. However, it's going to take so much more to, to basically address the health needs of the Napo Nation. There's a, there's a community in the um, western part of Navajo Nation. It's called Shiprock. So from Shiprock all the way down to um, Winder Rock, which is our capital, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of family actually don't have running water in that area. It took 37 years for Congress to finally give monies to the nation to get the water line in there. It's still, it's still not act, it still hasn't been activated yet. They're thinking a couple more years, they'll be able to get running water for, for that community. Then I believe it costs like $1.3 billion just for that portion of the Navajo Nation. We're still talking about the rest of the Navajo Nations for, so $600 million, you know, I'm not sure how that's going to happen. And the thing that, in the language itself, um, that the Congress have given to us and to everybody else across the United States, it has to be spent by December 30th, 2020. Well, if you're like 
I'll just use an example. If you're like Mayo Clinic or whatever, and you have everything in place, you have the infrastructure in place, you know where things are going to go. Yeah, $600 million, you can spend that in six months, no problem. However, we're talking about a community where unemployment is one of the highest in the country. So when President Trump talk, you know, talks about the lowest unemployment, well, he just needs to come onto an Indian reservation and realize how high the unemployment rates are. And, and that's all historical, but anyway. So yeah, it's, it's gonna be very challenging um, to just clear water, to clear you know, the land for, for, for water to come through. There's just so many different channels that we need to go through. You know, there's a lot of archeological sites in that area that need to be cleared. So, you know, it's, 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 a, big, it's a big thing that the tribe has to deal with. And, um, and, you know, and then of course, you know, they put the language in there, as you see in the left corner, the left lower corner, that it can only be used for expenses that incur due to the public health emergency. Well, if historical trauma, I think historical trauma led to this, a lot of this. So we're working as hard as we can with the nation, with several of the organizations to really highlight this. And we're hoping that this can make changes to, you know, to what is happening on the Napo Nation. Absolutely. I mean, this is just so rich. And I'm going to ask James to move on to the next slide and let you sort of briefly talk about water. And then we really want to get to some of the positives, what's being done, what can be done. Um, to help um, begin to turn this around. So I'm gonna let you talk just a bit about the water situation. So yeah, so I think COVID has exposed the fact that what over 40% of Navajo Nation, people that live on the Navajo Nation don't have running water. That's a real thing. Um, you know, we sit on all this water, um, but we had to fight for it, you know, you know, and, um, and it's still occurring at this point in time. This is real. The gentleman doing this hand pumping, it's, a, you know, and that those little, those hand pumps are located all over the Navajo Nation. We have one just down the road from where my, where my family lives. We call it Honey Springs. Um, but that water is actually just set up, you know, we weren't told back then, but it's just actually for animals because, the, na the land on which we, we live, there's, because of uranium um, and the arsenic, there's high level, levels of arsenic and uranium that um, are going into our waters now because of all the mining that has happened. And we just have to be very, very careful. And um, there's a paper that actually just got published recently where they're saying that where all the uranium mines are, which are on the northeastern, northwestern part of the Navajo Nation, and actually even on the eastern side, that these individuals, because of the water, the, the, the quality of the water may be at higher risk for complications due to COVID. So yeah, I mean, water is life. However, you know, we just, it just, it's just, for me, it's just social injustice. We should not even be dealing with this on the Napo Nation. You know, we should, every, every home should have running water and that's not the case. Family members have to go to the chapter house, for example, if they wanna take a shower, they have to go to chapter house and these are the price tags for, for taking a shower. And, um, and in these homes, they just have to sparingly use the water. It's not like they can just kind of turn on the faucet like you and I do or turn on the shower and take a five minute or 10 minute shower. No, that's not the case for these communities. So, you know, there's a lot that needs to happen and $600 million is just gonna be, we're just gonna address a little part of it um, in bringing equity into these communities. Thank you so much for that. I mean, the chat I see is just going nuts. I can't wait to, to hear some of the comments. Let's, let's talk about addressing COVID and what the tribes are doing or think would be the best ways to address it. James, if you could go on and show the next slide, that'd be awesome. Well, I've been doing, 
I've been doing work with the Navajo Nation and other tribes for over 20 years now. And our communities address health and probably like many other communities, non-native communities in a very holistic way. The Navajo word for, for that balance of finding balance is wajon. You know, it's, it's that, that where you find that inner peace and but for that inner peace to happen, everything around you has to be in balance. Your, your, your environment, your mind, your body and spirit, right? They all have to be in balance. And, and that's the approach that we're wanting to take, um, at least here with the Black Hills Center for American Indian Health. Um, we have employees down on Navajo Nation and you and I just let them, they're, they're more familiar than I am because I'm here in Rapid City, familiar to what the needs of the people are. And, and I think quickly within months, I think in like February, not February, in April, we had a conference call with them and they're like, the messaging really needs to talk about spiritual health and how we can incorporate spirituality into our healing. And we're just not hearing it through the radios. I think sometimes when you, I think, and I do that, I do this at times, you just want to look at the CDC guidelines. Oh, we got to do this X, Y, Z all the way down, checking it off, right? Well, just my experience with working with the Navajo Nation and um, tobacco control, I learned it the hard way that, you, you know, I, I was checking the list. I was like, oh, this is not evidence-based, so I'm not going to even try to incorporate, you know, to, to fight that. Well, that's not, that's not cool. <laughs> I found out that you really need the input of the community. When I say that I'm talking about the traditional healers and, you know, we, we um, so that's what the approach we have taken with Navajo Nation. We've reached out to the Zepe Nahuga of the Navajo Nation, which is a peyote-based um, organization. They um, actually have over about 10, 100,000 tribal members that are part of this belief system. Um, it's not even a belief system, it's a way of life. Um, so that's a third of the Navajo Nation, and then also the traditional healer organization, um, the Nehatkafli Association, we've reached out to them. And what we're wanting to do, at least with, with the peyote-based organization, or what, we, what is formerly called the Native American Church Organization, is to finally, we want to have them to have a place, a healing place, a healing center where they can go. Um, right now, there is nothing. And this is an organization that has literally fought to have the freedom to practice their traditions. It was outlawed by the federal government. Well, all tribes, actually, this falls for all tribes. All tribes could not practice any of their ceremonies from the eight, late 1800s to 19, I believe, 1978. Nothing, zero. You couldn't do any type of ceremonies. So a lot of these ceremonies went underground during that time period. And, and so did the peyote-based organization. And they finally made it so that, I mean, this is an awesome group of people that I'm dealing mm -hmm. with, but yeah. they are just so organized. Okay. So we're really going to really deal with trauma as, mm -hmm. as, you know, in terms of what COVID has done to right. the communities and really involving them and get, having been reach out and do whatever they can to have the communities heal. That's awesome, and thank you. We are, we got about ten minutes left. We we were worried that we were going to be under, and we're we're right at the clock. I'm going to go to the next slide, James, and um, and this will all be on your resources. But these are some of the organizations that are supporting what um, Navajo is doing, and we encourage you to take a look. If you want to go just quickly through these, um, Patricia, because we want to really have time for a few questions. And then we have a few more slides. So if you want to talk quickly about this, and again, all of this will be in your resource. Sure, as absolutely. Well. We appreciate any funding, of course. We're non all three organizations are nonprofits. On um, two of them are located on the Navajo Nation, um, the Black Hills Center for American Indian Health. We have a website that you can go to and donate. All funds that are donated will be used to work directly with the Navajo Nation traditional healer organizations. Is Eight Benahaga of Dene Nation. Um, 
they just actually right before the call gave me a website where you can go to donate. They're, they're really in need of funds as well as the Diné Hatchafi Association, this organization. My grandpa actually is the president of this organization. So it's, they, they have hundreds of traditional healers with this organization and they're just wanting to get the resources out, um, healing services out to the community. And you know, I can't say enough about these two organizations. They've just been really awesome to work with and their leadership and prayers have just meant so much during this time of, of crisis for our communities. Thank you so much for that. Why don't we now turn to Attica? I know we have quite a few questions and remember there's a discussion group right after this folks. So if we don't get to everything, we've got another hour after this as well. Attica? Wow, thanks Carla and Dr. Henderson. That was so educational, informative, and it was a call to action. So um, I definitely am one who appreciates you for sharing the Navajo Nation's experience with COVID-19. You had a lot of questions. So I'm gonna be honest with you, Dr. Henderson, we'll probably be able to get to two or three right now. And then the rest will have to go over to the discussion group. But one of the first questions that came through and also was on the reg registration page is how can we reduce the COVID-19 health inequities experienced by tribal communities. Oh, oh goodness. Well, I think three things that can be done. Donation, basically. Donate to organizations that are really doing the work in the communities, number one. Two is contact your legislators, contact your governors if there's policies on COVID that don't match up to what is happening within the tribes. Yeah, I mean, quick, very easy, get on the call. You know, that's what we've been doing with our governor here in South Dakota, you know, just getting on the call and trying to convince her to change her policies when it comes to, to just wearing a mask, right? I mean, it just is that easy. And the third is just basically, I think just just being on calls, being on webinars like this, I think for you to become educated about why why Indian country is the way it is right now is to learn about the history. I think the more you learn about the history, the better you are to inform the, the next decision you're gonna make on your end, right? So it's just learning, learning more and more about why tribes are, are in this situation. So that's something I would advocate for. Thank you so much, Dr. Henderson. You had another question that um, is a combination of both what came through Q&A and the registration. And the question is, what are some high priority policy changes related to COVID-19 that need to happen in order to prevent further systemic oppression? First is get Indian Health Service, the budget, the, the, the changing the budget so that Indian Health Service can do the work, basically. There's over what 500 and the last I like like 74 uh, federally recognized tribes. All our funding comes from the Indian Health Service, then it comes down to the communities. We're chronically underfunded, and it really is up to Congress and the President of the United States to make these changes. So, if there's anything that can happen at that level, it will be awesome. Uh, right now, you know, if you compare our, like I said earlier. Our, our, our delivery, healthcare delivery is so underfunded and it's just really incredibly frustrating to see that. The other policy is basically, again, going back to the governors, you know, if, if, if one state has stronger public health policies when it comes to addressing COVID and then the other state doesn't, it doesn't make, for me as a public health scientist, it, it does not make any sense. We should have had this whole COVID situation over and done with months and maybe a month ago, but we're still, we're still dealing with it. And unfortunately, because of the health situation on down on tribal, in tribal communities, it, it's just really frustrating to, um, to see the numbers continue to rise. So there's, those are some quick actions that I would highly recommend. <laughs> 
Thank you, Dr. Henderson. And actually, we're going to have to hold the rest of the questions over to the discussion group because we're at time. So um, I'm going to go, Carla, over to the discussion group and join Joanne there. Uh, thank you so much, Carla. All right, we have just a few more things that we wanted to let you know. We have th three new action, four new action learning guides that really talk about health equity, and we encourage you to um, get that information. Again, will be in our resource guide on our website. And then we also want you to join us for the special topic webinar series that's coming up. Um, we have those two that are coming up still one July 21st on the COVID Atlas and also responding to crisis in the Latinx population with a health equity lens. So again, I wanna thank Dr. Henderson and this isn't over. Um, we have the survey link that we'd ask you all to fill out as well as the discussion um, group that Raquel is chatting out. So look at that link and click on it so you can head on over to the discussion group. Dr. Henderson, we appreciate you. It was so good, we were right at time. And so this is just rich and we want you to head on over. Dr. Henderson will be over there as well with the discussion group. So we encourage everybody to click on the link and we'll have more conversation. It's not over. Thank you so much.